What's good, family? It's your boy, Big L. I'm trying something new tonight, man. I'm trying to to get this together. Um, it's been a... It's been a few... About a week, man, since I've actually recorded something, man, because I've been incredibly busy uh, doing school, family, work, all that. But I wanted to, to touch base with everyone, man, because I am truly, truly excited about what is taking place over here at the Page Turners. And I want to say thank you to everyone, man, who has tuned in, who has been a part of what we're doing here at the Page Turners, man, podcast, who enjoyed season one, um, Black Theology and Black Power by the late, great Dr. James H. Cohn. Oh, man, um, thank you, everyone, for subscribing, uh, just supporting, man, the encouragement, all those things. I'm so, so, so thankful for that. We are currently on season two of the Pace Turns podcast, man. And let me give you a brief overview real quick uh, for those who might be the first time that you, you know, uh, get an understanding or hear or, you know, see me talk about the Pacers. I'm a huge, huge uh, reader, man. I love to read her. I know it's some some term out there describing what it is about, you know, cold, what you call people who read and have tons of books and things along those lines. Whatever it is, I'm that guy. So I, I read a lot. And one of the things that I noticed in reading, man, was a lack of, um, a lack of black perspective, lack of black narrative, um, meaning that a lot of the, the book reviews and the book studies that I've seen, uh, whether it be YouTube or on other platforms, was, uh, from a non-black, usually white perspective. And I wanted to offer something different. I believe in literacy. I believe it's important to read, but I also believe that part of reading is offering um, necessary commentary and, and understanding to certain books and to certain terms and things along those lines. So I want to offer that uh, because I believe part of the whole narrative of reading is not just literacy education wise, but also racial literacy. And when I say racial literacy, I mean, uh, offer people an understanding on how race works, how racism works, um, how to respond to racism, how to recognize it, how to uh, reconcile it, uh, all those different things. So a lot of the books and things and discussion I'm going to pick uh, are going to be books where I can enlighten, encourage, and lead folk uh, to get a better understanding on a particular book. So, like I said, in season one, man, uh, I did uh, Black Theology and Black Power by Dr. James H. Cone, and I thought that particular book was incredibly instrumental and important for so many different reasons, man. Um, particularly if you're a black Christian. If you're a black Christian living in, uh, if you're a black Christian today uh, and you're trying to understand and navigate your way around uh, in this country, in America, you're really finding it rather difficult to reconcile uh, 
many of the different things that you're seeing taking place as a Christian. There's tons of questions that you may have of why is God not interceding? Why hasn't God interceded? Why he didn't intercede during the transatlantic slave trade? Uh, why is black, why, why, so many theological questions in regards to why God has not done what you feel God has done and with the, the number of different theological perspectives whether it be reformed or you know charismatic and you get some of these uh, you know responses like it, it's just God God can do what he wants to type of responses those responses are not responses that you uh, maybe come through with. I know for me, reading Black Theology and, and Black Power, uh, which was written or was published in 1969, was very crucial for me to understand how to navigate this world uh, as a Black Christian, uh, as a Black man who is a Christian and navigating this society to, to find a comfortable place with my faith and my 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 F, my my race, um, it was it's very very crucial. Um, I encourage you folks, man, who to to go back and check out season one uh, of that of this particular of that book study to get an understanding of what um, what I'm talking about. I don't want to do one of the things, man, and, and, and I'm saying a lot of this because I think uh, with me just beginning the YouTube channel, starting the Facebook page, and all these different, you know, avenues to, to get what I'm doing out, I want to be clear on some things. I'm not, I don't do a podcast because I'm trying to be popular. I don't do a podcast because uh, I have all the answers. I don't do a podcast because uh, I think of myself in such a way that I am giving you a product that you should gravitate to. Nah, nah, I, I don't feel that way. I feel like I'm someone who uh, has a passion for reading. I have a passion for people. I have a unwavering un, uh, unwavering love for black people so I want to help them in any possible way and in this manner I believe that I can offer something that I don't think many people are offering so I don't do a whole lot of the promotions that a lot of other podcasts do uh, I believe that if I give you a product you'll come to the product based off the quality of the content that I don't need to give you a bunch of gimmicks and most of you folks who are watching or, and, and, and know me know I'm not a gimmick dude No, I'm, I'm rather straightforward I'm going to say what I'm going to say uh, things along those lines and, and as far as the podcast the podcast in itself each episode man you can catch it on YouTube, you can catch it on Spotify, you can catch it on Google Play, you can catch it on iTunes, you can catch it on a host of, 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 of different platforms, and each episode is only going to hit you with, I'm only going to give you 30 minutes, man, I'm not, not going to spend a whole lot of time um, going so, giving you so much that, you know, you lose interest rather quickly, because what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab a book, I'm going to read from the book, and then I'm going to share my thoughts on a particular book. And if I do lives like this on Facebook, hopefully there'll be some engagement back and forth. If not, that's fine. I'm not, you know, I'm, it just doesn't, you know, change the direction of what I'm going. Um, and that's it, man. I'm just going to give you... 30 minutes of a, of a book and we're going to chop it up and then we're going to go about our business uh, hopefully you share the information with other folk and if you share great, if you don't share cool also uh, I'm doing this out of passion I'm doing this out of a love I'm not doing it to you know gain some other form of notoriety success or whatever the case may be um 
So with all that being said, uh, first off, I want to thank all you guys for tuning in to watch, whether you're watching it live now or you checking it out later on. Uh, I see my man, Kirk, man, love you, bro. It's been a long time. I haven't seen you in a long time. Man. I haven't talked to you in a long time. Uh, great friends of mine, great friend of mine. I really appreciate that, brother. Uh, and I'm just, I'm just going to chop it up, man. So season two is where we are now currently with this book study. Uh, and this particular book, I wrestled, really wrestled with trying to find a book on the hills of black theology and black power that we did in season one. I really tried to find a book that was going to uh, be just as encouraging, just as enlightening uh, as with Dr. James Combs' work, but also something that was really, really prevalent and relevant to where we are today. Um, so, I spend a lot of time reading and researching poverty and the racial wealth gap and uh, all those different things. So I'm really, really focused and, and, and keen on sharing that information. So I was going to do one book called uh, When Affirmative Action Was White. Uh, because I want to share with people the policies and things along those lines that that were put in place to lead and negate some of the successes that black folks were not able to, to, to achieve. Uh, I was going to do that, but then I came across this other book, man, that we're doing on now, and it is called Evicted. Evicted by Matthew Desmond. Uh, Man, uh, I came across this this this, this gentleman on Twitter. Uh, just some of his tweets about evicted and, and people being evicted, and uh, just some of the stories that he was sharing. I'm gonna read the back of it, and then I'm just gonna dig into the text, man. Uh, the back of it reads as follows, and this is some of the awards and accolades this gentleman has gotten winner of the 2016 National Book Critics Circle Award, winner of the 2017 Penn John Kenneth Gilbride Award, winner of the 2017 Andrew Carnegie Medal, winner of the 2017 Penn and New England Award, winner of the 2016 Barnes and Noble Discovery Great New Writers Award, finalist for the 2016 Los Angeles Times Book Prize, finalist for the 2016 Kirkus Prize, and this is a summary of the book. In Evicted, Princeton sociologist and MacArthur genius Matthew Desmond follows eight families in Milwaukee as they each struggle to keep a roof over their heads. Held as a wretching and revelatory, the nation, vivid and unsettling, the New York Review of Books, Evicted transforms our understanding of poverty and economic exploitation while providing fresh ideas for solving one of 21st century America's most devastating problems. Its unforgettable scenes of hope and loss remind us of the centrality of home without which nothing else is possible. And so this gentleman has received tons of, of, of awards for this book, man. And I'm just opening up my notebook because I jotted down some notes as I was uh, reading this chapter and going over it at work. I'm in chapter three of this book right now, uh, and I was skimming through it at work and trying to get some of the main ideas and things down to be able to share with you guys as I'm giving commentary. And I was uh, I was blown away, man, by some of the stuff that I read and. Yeah, let me let me go ahead and, and dig into chapter three. Chapter three is titled Hot Water. Lenny Lawson stepped out of his trailer park office to a burn to burn a palm oil. Smoke drifted up past his mustache and light blue eyes and disappeared above a baseball cap. 
He looked out over the rows of mobile homes bunched together on a skinny strip of asphalt. Almost all the trailers were lined up in the same direction and set a couple steps apart. The airport was close, and even longtime residents looked up when planes came in low, exposing their underbellies and rattling the windows. Lenny had spent his entire life in this place, all 43 years of it, and for the past dozen years he had worked as his manager. Lenny knew the druggies lived mostly on the north side of the trailer park, and the people working double shifts at restaurants or nursing homes lived mostly on the south side. The metal scrappers and cane collectors lived near the entrance. And the people with the best jobs, sandblasters, mechanics, congregating on the park's snobby side behind the office, in mobile homes with freshly swept porches and flower pots. Those on SSI were sprinkled throughout, as were the older folks who went to bed with the chickens and woke up with the chickens, as some park residents like to say. Lenny tried to house the sex offenders near the druggies, but it didn't always work out. He had to place one near the double shifters. Thankfully, the man never left his trailer or even opened the blinds. Someone delivered food and other necessities to him every week. College Mobile Park Home, on the far south side of the city, on 6th Street off College Avenue, and this is taking place in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. It was bordered on one side by overgrown trees, shrubs, and sand pits, and on the other side by a large truck distribution center. It was a 15-minute walk to the nearest gas station or fast food restaurant. There were other trailer parks nearby, surrounded by streets with modest, tiny brick homes and sharply pitched roofs. This was part of the Milwaukee where poor white folks lived. The Minami River Valley cuts through the middle of the city and functions like it's the Mason-Dixon line, dividing the predominantly black north side from the predominantly white south side. Now, if you know anything about most major cities, man, most major cities are divided or, and segregated in some form or fashion, whether it be most of the black folks live on the north side or the south side, the west side. You see this in every predominantly or every major city this form of segregation in many instances is forced segregation in a lot of instances it's self-segregation is just meaning that you want to be with your own kind your own people okay Milwaukeeans used to joke that 16th Street Viaduct, which stretches over the valley was the largest bridge in the world because it connected Africa to Poland and you'll see why they say Africa to Poland here in just a moment. The biggest effort to change that came in 1967 when 200 demonstrators, almost all of them black, gathered at the north end of the viaduct and began walking to Poland to protest housing discrimination. So the viaduct is a big bridge, man. So what happened was black folks decided that they were sick of housing discrimination that was taking place. So they were going to cross over to the bridge from Africa to Poland, okay, to protest the damage, to protest the de- housing discrimination that took place. So this is in 1967. Ah, so we see this taking place here, man. This is we see this sort of thing happening today, but it's nothing new, okay? So, 200 demonstrators, mostly all of them black, were going to cross over this bridge to go over to the white side of Milwaukee to protest housing discrimination. As the marchers approached the south side of the bridge, they heard the crowd before they saw it. Chants of, kill, kill, we want slaves, rose up above the rock and roll music blasted from loudspeakers. Then the crowd appeared, a deep swell of white faces, upwards of 13,000 by some counts. Onlookers hurled bottles, rocks, piss, spit down on the, on the marchers. The black demonstrators march. The white mob pulse and seethe. And then something released. Some invisible barrier fell. And the white onlookers lurched forward, 
crashing down on the marchers. That's when the police fired tear gas. So the police didn't intercede when the white folks was pissing, spitting, throwing bottles and everything at the black, mar- predominantly black marchers. The police didn't intercede until the white folks fell into the crowd of black folks. Then it became a problem and they interceded. The marchers returned the next night and the night after that. They walked the 16th Street Viaduct for 200 consecutive nights. The city, then the nation, then the world took notice. Little change. A 1967 New York Times editorial declared Milwaukee as America's most segregated city. A supermajority in both houses had helped President Johnson pass the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Acts of 1965. But legislators, backed by real estate lobbies, refused to get behind his open housing law, which would have criminalized housing discrimination. So, so Johnson wanted to put laws in, in place to eradicate based off of the text here, eradicate some of the housing discrimination. But guess who didn't want that to take place? The lobbyists, the folks behind a lot of the politicians, man, refused to support the president's decision to go forth. So we see that a lot, man. We see that a lot when it comes to politicians wanting to make decisions oftentimes their heart may be in the right place. They may have the right desire and they desire to do the right thing. But they're unfortunately the people who pay them. <laughs> it took Martin Luther King Jr. being murdered on a Memphis balcony and the riots that ensued for Congress to include a real open housing measure later that year in the 1968 Civil Rights Act, commonly called the Fair Housing Fair Housing Act. The white working class South Side had, since the 1930s, made room for a small number of Hispanic families whose men had been recruited to work in the tanneries. In the 1970s, the Hispanic population began to grow. Instead of putting up another fight, whites began moving out. Pushing further south and west, Poland became Mexico, a small enclave for the near south side of the city. The north side remained black. The east and west sides of the city, as well as the far south where Lenny's trailer park sat, belonged to the whites. Open housing law or not, Milwaukee will remain one of the most racially divided cities in the nation. Lenny stamped out his cigarette and ducked back into the office, which was situated in the middle of the trailer park, near its only entrance and exit. It was cramped in windowless space, paper cluttered and lit by a naked bulb screwed into the ceiling. The old fax machine, calculator, and computer were covered with grease smudges. In the summer, a wet spot grew on a thin maroon carpet under the leaky air conditioning unit. In the winter, a space heater buzzed softly on a plastic blanket. Over the years, Lenny had added some flourishes. Static antlers, a passable resin, blue ribbon plaque, a poster of a flush pheasant. Hey, Lenny greeted Susie as he took his seat behind his desk. Susie Dunn was on her feet as usual, sorting mail into the mailboxes made up on one side of the office. She was not placing letters in the boxes as much as punching them in there, fast and hard. It was her way. When Susie smoked, she sucked the cigarette down, keeping her hand close to her mouth. She couldn't talk without also sweeping or scrubbing or rearranging patio furniture. It was as if she'd fall over like a toy top if she stopped spinning. Susie's husband liked to call her the queen of the trailer park. Other people settled for office Susie so as not to confuse her with heroin Susie. (laughs) Here's your unemployment check, Susie said to her letter. Now why don't you pay some rent? If she don't pay her rent, she ain't gonna be living here much longer. She can move back to the south side or live in the ghetto. Now remember, 
in the book, he breaks down and he talks about how, what's the South Side? The South Side is where who lives? The black folk. Okay, and this is gonna be key as we get further in this chapter, that oftentimes, you know, we don't think or realize that even poor whites oftentimes have a real nasty racist white supremacist attitude towards uh, toward black folk. Very, very, very important, man, to, to, to get that piece right there. That's key. Okay? The office door opened and in walked Miss Mertz. Barefoot. At 71, she was taunt, an unfrail woman with a shock of cotton white hair, a face crisscrossed with wrinkles and no teeth. Hey, Granny, Lenny said with a smile. He, like everyone else in the park, thought Miss Merch was crazy. Guess what I did today? I threw a bill in the garbage can, Miss Merch looked at him, sighed along with her bunched up face. She almost yelled the words. Hmm, is that right, Lenny answered, looking at her. I'm no dummy. Hmm. Well, I've got some bills for you. You can pay mine. Ha! Miss Mertz said, walking out to start her day, pushing a grocery cart and collecting cans. Miss Mertz paid the bills with her SSI check. She cashed in the cans to give her mentally challenged adult daughter snack money, or after a nice haul, a trip to Chuck E. Cheese's. Lenny grinned and went back to his paperwork until the door swung open. People who got half an ear everywhere else got a full one from Lenny. It was up to him to keep track of rents and maintenance requests, to screen tenants and deliver eviction notices. But it was also up to him to listen to the trailer park to know it, know who was current and who was behind, who was pregnant and who was mixing their methadone with Xanax. Whose boyfriend, whose boyfriend had just been released. Sometimes I'm a shrink, he liked to say. Sometimes I'm the village asshole. Yeah, Lenny, uh, about that. The owner of the trailer park was named Tobin Charney. He lives 70 miles away in Skokie, Illinois, but visited the trailer park every day except Sunday. My man lives 70 miles away. You feel me? And he visits the trailer park every single day. So 70 times two, to and fro, my man drove 140 miles every single day to that trailer park. Now he's the owner. Lenny's just the property manager. My man drives 140 miles every single day, family, to check on that dog on trailer park. Now, don't nobody drive that much unless they know what. There has to, what's the incentive for him to be driving that much? What, what is he gaining? Money. My man coming to get his paper. He coming to check on his change. Because ain't nobody driving that much, that often, unless it's for some sort of financial gain, right? And listen to how he pays Lenny and Susie. Because this is this is where it gets you begin to get some insight into the way some of these these landlords, slumlords operate. Okay? He paid off his Susie five dollars an hour and reduced her rent to four hundred and forty. Tobin waived Lenny's rent and paid him a salary of thirty-six thousand dollars a year in cash. So Lenny don't pay no rent. Lenny lives rent free, okay? And on top of that, Lenny gets almost $40,000 a year in cash. <sighs> Tobin had a reputation for being flexible and understanding, but no one thought of him a pushover. A hard man with a squinting eyes and an unsmiling face, he had a gruff, hurry way about him. He was 71, the same age as Miss Mertz and worked out regularly, keeping a gym bag in the trunk of his Cadillac. He was not chummy with his tenants or amused by them. He did not pause to ruffle the children's hair. He did not pretend he was anything he was not. His father had been a landlord and at one point owned almost 600 units. 
all Tobin desired was one address and 131 trailers. But in the final week of May 28, 2008, he found himself on the verge of losing them. All five members of the Milwaukee's License Committee have refused to renew Tobin's license to operate the trailer park. Alderman told Terry Wikowski, a longtime Southsider with a pinkish face and silver hair, was leading the charge. Wikowski pointed to the 70 code violations that neighborhood services had documented in the past two years. He brought up the 260 police calls made from the trailer park in the previous year alone. He said the park was a haven for drugs, prostitution, and violence. He observed that an unconnected plumbing system had recently caused raw sewage to bubble up and spread under 10 mobile homes. The license committee now considered the trailing park an environmental biohazard. You think? Do you think it's a virus? On June 10th, the city council called the Common Council in Milwaukee would vote. If the licenses committee's decision stood, Tobin would be out of a job and his tenants would be out of a home. That's when the newspaper showed up with their gel hair and shoulder-mounted cameras that looked like weapons. They interviewed the, wep- the, the residents including some outspoken critics of Tobin. The media paints us as ignorant half-breeds, Mary was saying to Tina outside her trailer. They said this was the shame of the South Side, Tina replied. Both women had been in the park for years and both had strong, wind-blown faces. My son hasn't slept because of this, Mary went on. Neither have I or my husband. You know, I work two jobs. I work hard. I mean, I can't afford to go anywhere else. Miss Mertz walked up and put her face right up next to Tina's. Tina took a step back. That son of a bitch, Miss Mertz began. I'm going to call the alderman. I'm going to give him a piece of my mind. That son. See, but that won't help, Tina cut in. I'm going to go. I'm going to give that alderman a piece of my mind, Miss Mertz replied. That little son of a bitch. Tina and Mary shook their heads as Miss Merch stomped off. Then Mary turned serious. And this is where Melissa family people people is right here though. Then Mary turned serious. And to be told to move to the north side is not funny. She said, it's not funny. She shook a little, little and broke eye contact to keep from crying. That was the heart of it. What trailer park residents feared the most. When Mary and Tina and Ms. Mertz and the whole trailer park talked about having to leave, what they were talking about was the possibility of having to move to the black ghetto. Office Susie was one of several residents who had previously lived on the north side where her adult son had a gun stuck in his face. The alderman said this is a ghetto slum. She vented, I'll show you a ghetto. The situation twisted Susie's stomach so much that her son hid her pain pills, fearing she would swallow a handful. Family, did you did you get that? Did you did you get did you get that just now? Let, let, me, let me let me let me go back a little bit because I, I I need you to make sure that you get this. They don't want to move to the north side. Not just not move to the north side because of the crime and things that are taking place. They don't want to move to the north side because that's where the black folks are. It's, it, it can't be the crime. It can't be the poverty. It can't be any of those other things. It's only because of the black folks. Now, how do LG? Why are you saying it's just the black folks, bro? Why? Why can't it be the crime? Because we just read on the other page. Okay, he brought up the 260 police calls made from the trailer park in the past year. So, the trailer park 
had the cops come out 260 times in one year. It's only 365 days in a year. So 260 of those times, of those days, the police showed up. Then the sewage, they had raw sewage pumping up out of there. The park was a haven for drugs, prostitution, and violence. But that violence was cool if that violence was white violence. The violence was cool if it was just white folks. It wasn't no issue. But it became a problem for these people if they were evicted from where they lived in this trash slum and ended up having to go and live on the north side with the black folk. That's, that's, that's mind blowing, family. No matter how bad things are, it could be worse if they live next to black folks. What? section man and then I'm gonna I'm a lie it out uh, I kept you guys for about this the time is looking it says about 36 minutes man I try to keep you right around 30 because I you know I know folks get a little tired I know you know it's a whole lot of stuff going on I don't want to hold you too long okay but let me read this last little section for you man and then we'll wrap up this episode episode 4 and then we'll come back you know what I mean next week and we'll begin from this particular section the trailer park had 10 days before the final vote. So tenants hosted a barbecue for the media. <laughs> Began calling local re- representatives and started to recite what they would say to the common council. Rufus the junk collector with his trim red beard and distant blue eyes wrote up his comments and practice. And then I'll say, who has been behind on their rent? $500. And the hands will go up. And I will keep going. $700. A thousand. And all the hands will go up. Rufus planned to end his speech by saying, This is no slumlord. This is not a bad man. If his speech didn't work and the trailer park was closed, Rufus was planning to put planning to put a reciprocating saw to these trailers and sell the aluminum. I'm going to stop there, man. I'm going to stop right there. Uh, This is season two, episode four, book study, the Page Turners podcast with your boy Big L, uh, evicted by Matthew Desmond. Uh, powerful book man powerful read Uh, we are currently in chapter 3 did you you peep it though I mean it was was so much there man Uh, even in the midst of poverty even in the midst of poverty racism white supremacy still exists still exists because these white folks who live in this trash should be condemned without question trail apart are doing everything that they can do to keep their homes so they don't have to move to the north side where the black folks are Listen, man, I'm just giving you, giving you what the book says, man, giving you, you know what I mean, with my man, the sociologist, 
school. The white sociologist, by the way, because I don't want you guys to, you know, some of y'all might think that, oh, you just picked this book because, you know, it paints white folks in a negative light. Oh, no, 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 no. This book is not about painting white folks in any unfair light. No, 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 no. This book will highlight how evictions are on the rise in this country. And then it begins to talk about ways to solve those evictions. It talks about the causes and the reasons for these evictions. And I'll be honest with you, I don't know if you've ever been evicted before. Being evicted is a traumatic experience. And I know a lot of folk, man, who are on the verge, who are a, a, a missed paycheck away. A, a, a missed paycheck away, a, a sickness away, a car breaking down, a, a, a illness away from being evicted. Yeah, man. So, I like the way this flowed. I like the, the, the setup of it, man. So, I'm going to try to maintain this particular uh, format, meaning I'm going to continue to try to do the live broadcast from the Page Turner Podcast Facebook page, then upload the actual audio to YouTube, to Anchor, to Spotify, and all those other places, man, but I like the fact that I can do it here. And I can take you from the Page Turner Podcast with Elgin Bailey Facebook page and load it up to my own personal page and share it that way. I'm feeling this. I, I like this format, man. I think this is good. I like the flow of it. Uh, yeah, man. Uh, I ain't got nothing else, man. But just, you know, next next broadcast, man, episode five, is it won't be as lengthy. I'm going to give a quick, you know, housekeeping comments in the beginning, and we 